recording and hello everybody and welcome to yet another episode of witches and wine this is the show where we talk about witchy stuff and we drink wine clink, clink and, and drink. drink clink and drink everybody clink and clink drink, and drink. drink. Clink and drink and clink right and drink. I mean, I could have grabbed that. But. Ooh. My name is Lola Stardust. I am your hostess with the mostest. And before we start the show, I'd like to do a little disclaimer. Uh, this show is called Witches and Wine, and it has been brought to our attention. Some people have watched the show, and they don't appreciate the the fun that we have when we've had a little too much wine, and they've complained. <laughs> So we have this wonderful thing that you can do. There is an X on the corner of your screen. Just click it. Click it, and we'll disappear like magic, and you don't have to watch us be drunken fools. And you have the power. You have the power, which is you have the power. It's all in your hands. All right. So before we get to this amazing guest that I'm so excited about, I'm going to turn this over to my high priest, my partner in crime, my best friend, and my husband. Silent as Stardust, why don't you tell us about the wine we're drinking tonight? Oh, well, I'd be happy to. Uh, tonight, we went back to Bordeaux, me and Lola's favorite place in the world for wine. We love our Bordeaux. Yes, we do. Uh, this is definitely a right bank Bordeaux. It's called Arbalest. Um, it is made by Benoit Touquet. Um, it is definitely a right bank Merlot. Uh, what Bordeaux. does right bank mean? Uh, right bank means it's Merlot Dominic. There is a river that runs down the center of the Bordeaux region. Um, the wines to the on the left of the river are known as left bank wines, and they're cab dominant. Oh. Or the wines to the right, and the grapes to the right are right bank, and they're merlot dominant. I did not even know that. Yes. Left we hand were... pass, right hand. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> yes, I did that. Your your left opposite. your left banks are typically your more age worthy wines, where this is a right bank, so this is a little bit more uh, more merlot. Yeah. Merlot dominant. Um, eighty percent merlot, fifteen cab, five uh, percent petit verdot. Definitely dry. Oh, so yeah. if you like a really dry Bordeaux, this is a great wine. Uh, yeah. You're running 25, 30 bucks. Um, really, really, really pleasant. A lot of blackberry and a lot of boysenberry on this guy. Yeah. So it's going to pair por nicely if you do a really intense pork dish um, or a softer like tri-tip steak. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and step out now because we have... Zeta in our house, a coven sister, who's going to step in and interview our absolutely wonderful guest. We're so honored to have him. Um, and I will let him kind of mention what he's drinking, and then we'll bring him in afterwards. Thank you, buddy. Mwah. See Yay. you guys next week. You like it? It's good. Hi, Zeta! Zeta, the, the artist formerly known as Isleen. Yeah. Zeta's my original co-host but then pandemic started and it was just me and my husband doing it which is great but i miss my i miss my co-host oh i miss being here i know <laughs> so as you guys can see on the screen if you don't know who this is it is jason Mankey, and he wants to introduce his wine why don't you introduce your wine and then we'll introduce you see i don't care about myself tonight it's all about this wine here yeah. a there perfect accompaniment to wait on election returns with <laughs> this is a, a Cabernet from Napa Valley. From Maryville is the name of the winery. And my wife and I are actually members of their wine club. So we really like their wine. It's a very typical California cab. Uh, it's uh, very extremely drinkable. I am not as knowledgeable as others about wine. I just go with, do I like it or do I not like it? There you and go. I happen to like this one quite a bit. Interesting fact about Maryville, they're the only winery that has ever made a dessert wine that I find palatable. Really? So, yes. Oh. So, hats off to them. Love Yay! Yay for wine. Clink California. and drink. That's our, that's our thing. Clink and drink. Oh, oh, oh. Jason Mankey, you're a man that is known for your... You're, you do the blogs on uh, Pathy. Why don't, actually, why don't you introduce who you are? I, I, you know you better than I do. So tell me, who are you? What do you do? That's always, like, dangerous. Like, who are you? you know? <laughs> it, either, it either means you're going to get the most grandiose introduction to a guest ever, or they're just going to say, hello, I'm Jason, I'm a harmless drudge, which is probably inadequate 
So I will say that I've been practicing witchcraft for over 25 years. I'm an initiated gardenarian. I run two covens in California in Silicon Valley. I run Pathios Pagan. I'm the channel manager there, which means I oversee a lot of the blogs. I don't edit things. That okay. re- that that implies I have some sort of journalistic power. Yeah. Uh, so that's not the case at all. Uh, so I don't have that. But I do work for Pathios and run that. And I've also written seven Llewellyn books. Yeah, seven. Yeah. Six have been published. The seventh comes out in June. My latest book, you know, because, you know, I am all about shameless plugs. Of is course. Llew- Llewellyn's Little Book of Yule. And as you can see, it is a little book. It and is it's Yule. all about the Yuletide season. I'm very happy with it. No I less than an authority other than my father says it's the best book I've ever written. Well, I know Yule is your is your is your favorite, isn't it? It is my favorite Sabbath by huge margins. Yeah, I want to know why Llewellyn would put out another set because this would be the third set of their Sabbath books, and now I'm going to need a third set of Sabbath books to look pretty on my shelf. Yes. So not, the like, little I'm book series kind of like. Take my money. Yeah. <laughs> the little book series is not just about Sabbaths. So there's like Llewellyn's Little Book of Unicorns, Llewellyn's Little Book of Chakras. Like there are lots and lots of Llewellyn little books. Hey, Mickey Mueller wrote Llewellyn's Little Book of Halloween, which is about Halloween and not so much about Samhain. Yeah. And this book is not really like just about Yule as the winter solstice. Because most of us know that Yule is also another name for Christmas. So what this book is should have really been called is Llewellyn's Little Book of Yuletide. Because it's about the whole season from Thanksgiving in the United States all the way through some weird holidays in early January that are a part of the holiday season. So well, you, you did a workshop for uh, Hecate Sickle for us. I'm, and I was the workshop coordinator. So that's kind of how I got in touch with with Jason, I made some connections, and I'm like, oh, I got some connections. I'm going to ask if he wants to be on our show. What's the worst that'll happen? He'll say you're a bunch of drunk witches, and I'll be on the show. Yes. yes. Anyway, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, you did a workshop about that, the Halloween thanks must, th- hollow, uh, that, Hall- that, Hall- yes. thanks must, and I loved it because you, you really love the holidays. You really love that stuff, and you can tell that what you were talking about was so like you were excited about it. And I love when people get excited about the topic. So can you tell us, I mean, without going into too much detail, what got you into looking at this? Cause you were talking about the mummers and how Thanksgiving really um, is not, it, it is kind of a combination of, you know, Halloween and then going into Yule. They, they kind of all blend together. What got you into all this? What, why do you love that so much? It probably comes from greed as a small child. So I never got anything throughout the year other than on my birthday, which was January 4th. So, you know, that's just more winter clothes and crap. It's what Capricorn. you didn't... Get. I'm a Capricorn too, January 18th. Hello. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just what you don't get for Christmas when you're a kid, right? Yes. And... So, and then I got a lot of stuff at Christmas, but the rest of the year, my parents didn't buy me anything. So (laughs) Christmas was a very exciting time for young Jason, because that is when he got, you know, a year's worth of Masters of the Universe toys and various other things. So I was in love with Christmas from a very young age. And my father and my grandparents always made it a very magical time. And when I like something, I want to know as much as I possibly can about it. Yeah, and so I think by the time I was in fifth grade, I was already sort of exploring the ho- the traditions of Christmas. Yeah, you know, like I knew the Krampus before the Krampus Renaissance. Yeah, you know, I was down with looking at this stuff from a very early age. And well, yeah. one of the great things about when I became a witch was I got to take almost all of that shit with me on this new journey because half of it comes from us, anyways. Yep. And the other half that's interesting really has nothing to do with Jesus. So whether or not the Krampus is a pagan survival doesn't matter. It's got nothing to do with Jesus anyways. So, yeah. So all the cool stuff you can play with. So 
yeah, I got to I got to have all of that. And my parents still do Christmas, so I still get to do that. It's a yep. national holiday. It's a secular holiday at this point. You know, and I get the winter solstice, and I just love all of it. And yeah. weirdly, my favorite holiday is actually Thanksgiving because I love football, and I get to watch football all day. Yeah. And I get to cook for like six hours for my friends, and that's fun. And exactly. have this delicious meal. That's my and, husband, yeah. Yeah. Football and food. Yeah. Foodball. Foodball. <laughs> there are low expectations for Thanksgiving, which may be why I like it. Yep. You don't have to buy things for people. They don't have to buy you anything. Unless you ruin the turkey, there's really no disappointment. No. And even right. sometimes if you do ruin the turkey, it's you can work around it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can't. We've had a couple out at our place where we haven't had electricity, so cooking the turkey was kind of interesting. Oh, a couple that would of be, years. That would be. They live in a like a hundred year old farmhouse. So wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but have, you made it work. Yep. That's how they do it. That's how those country witches make it work. Uh, I have <laughs> to live within stumble home distance from a bar. So you know, I live in a downtown, five blocks from a train station and several pubs. That's. That's how yeah. I do things. You're an urban witch. We're urban witches here. But we have, in our coven, we have the country witches. We get the best of both. The country mouse yeah. and the city mouse. That would be a good book. The country witch and the city witch. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. You heard it here first. You heard it here first. <laughs> I mean, I have seven Llewellyn books. Apparently, they'll print about anything. So yeah. you're in good shape. <laughs> hilarious so um how did you get involved how long have you been uh involved with uh patheos since 2011 when it was when i was first talking to them and i started writing for them in 2012 so it's been and eight I, years now i read a lot of Pathios, and I read. Obviously, it's it's I, some of my favorite writers are on Pathios, um, but I'm not familiar with how. Do you guys like vet those who write, or do you let people just submit? And you guys, how does that work? I am the vetter for the most part. I'm not any vetter. I'm just the vetter. You're not the Eddie vetter. Is that what no. you? <laughs> yes, I'm not the Eddie vetter, but I am the You're vetter. Wait, no, that's not Eddie Vedder. That was Eddie Vedder. That was yeah. Eddie Vedder? That was even flow. <laughs> no. Even flow. No, I thought I did. Okay, sorry. All around <laughs> like butterflies. Yeah. Jer we're from Spokane, Washington, so the song Jeremy spoke in class today, we used to sit, because we're in Washington State, Spokane, we said, Jeremy is Spokane, Spokane. Anyway, so, yeah. All right, that's go awesome. ahead. Yeah. <laughs> it's... You know, finding writers is sort of an open-ended process. Sometimes people contact me, and I take a look at their work. Sometimes the answer is no, because I just don't think it's good enough, or it doesn't really fit with the other writers. Like, it, Pathos Pagan is very liberal. I'm probably not going to bring in the Republican witch blog anytime soon. So, yeah, you know, there yeah. it has to fit with everything else. And the writing has to be at least somewhat good. Sometimes... We've had some that aren't great writers, and it happens. But for the most yeah. part, I think our writers are all pretty good. Uh, you know, so it's mostly just me. Luckily, I know about everybody in the pagan community at this point. Yeah. So yeah. if I don't know somebody, I'm always just like Kevin Bacon, you know, less than seven steps from them, which yeah. is useful. Six degrees. Six degrees of Kevin yeah. Bacon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know. Da, 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 so and so knows. And yeah. Who knows, Selena Fly? Okay, now I know you. Yes, yes. Yeah. Some of the writers of Pathios I inherited from my predecessors. Uh, Star Foster was the first uh, channel manager at Pathios, and Christine Kramer was the second one. Star brought me in all those years ago. But like yeah. she brought in John Beckett and Lil Dorsey, who have been there for a long time. Uh, Christine brought in uh, Brandy Williams, who's okay. been there a long, you know, pretty long time too. Yeah. So, I mean, we have some blogs there that are just about as old as mine, which is kind of cool. Yeah. We're also about the last blog site standing. Yeah. Just yeah. for pagans. Yeah. We like, uh, I we like a uh, Thorn. Thorn. Yes. 
uh, Thorn Mooney. That's Thorn Mooney. Right. Yeah, we 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 like her a lot. I wanna. I've been working on trying to get her on our show, but you know, people's schedules and you know, we're just we're a little unknown little thing here in the in the west part of the country. But for now, for now, but we're working our way up. We're I'm, working. Our way up. I I adore Thorn Mooney. She's one of my favorite people in the world. We frequently text each other. She stayed at my house a couple oh, of times. Wow. Yeah, we, we're very close with Thorne, Ari and I. Ari is my wife. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we love we love Thorne to death. Yeah, she's, she's awesome. I like, I like her uh, her YouTube channel that she does. Mm-hmm. I like a lot of the stuff. Cause she, and it's, it's along the same lines of why we like you so much. You guys are really down to earth because I feel like, and we were just talking about this, I have a, a note on my laptop that <laughs> says, Stop the Gatekeeping. And to me, that me and my coven sister was like, I was "What does like, this what's mean?" That? I knew what this one meant. Cause yeah. She's got two notes on the laptop. Yeah, and she goes, <laughs> "What is stop the gatekeeping?" And to me, it's about the witches who have been around for a long time, and they've been doing their traditions, and you know, our we have to remember we are a spiritual group. We are, we, there really are no set tenets of our religion if you're Wiccan. Um, so we're kind of going how it feels. How does it feel to you? And there are certain people that want to say, though, that's the wrong way to do it or that you're not doing it the way that you should be. And I've always enjoyed your voice in the pagan community because you give a voice to those that we're going to do it the way we feel, you know, we, how we feel and and you, right. I mean, is that, that's something you believe in, right? And it's very much like my tradition is good for me and I'm going to continue doing my tradition, but that doesn't mean that the coven three doors down has to do it the same way. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I love being a gardenarian, but I know that it's not for everybody else, and it's not the only tradition. You know, it's one of hundreds of traditions, and yeah. they're all valid as far as I'm concerned. I, you know, t- to me, like right now, you see this big, the biggest sort of conflict is between older witches. I don't want to say baby boomers, but <clears throat> baby, bo- but it's baby boomers mostly, and then kind of the Instagram witches. Yeah. Well. Yeah. They're just about pretty pictures and stuff, and they're not doing the work. And how can we mentor them and stuff? Well, maybe they don't want you to fucking mentor them. <laughs> and, you know, maybe... Bring right back around. One of my personal favorites that I love about your blogs and stuff is um, we share a personal place of... Cautious veneration for Silver Ravenwolf. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yes. She she friended me on Facebook. And, yeah. you know, so I got that little friend request one day from, oh, my fucking God, Silver Ravenwolf. <laughs> and I must have, like, danced and screamed through the house like a small child. This is only, like, three years ago. Uh, yeah. You know, I did the same thing when Janet Ferrar sent me one of those, too. Silver yeah. Raven Wolf has been unnecess- unnecessarily shit on pretty heavily for the last, what, 30 years? Yeah, yeah. since 1990 or so. And she's a terrific writer. She yeah. really is a great writer. Like, you can read her work and you're like, wow, I'm immersed in this piece of writing. Yeah. And her witchcraft is pretty solid. I still think to write a silver broomstick has aged better than yeah. all of the other Gen X or Baby Boomer intro books. I mean, well, I, I, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I mean, I love uh, the Farrar's Witch's Bible. That's oh, probably yeah. my, you know, maybe my favorite, but it hasn't aged as well as Broomstick, and Broomstick's aged a lot better than Scott Cunningham, which mm-hmm. at this point I probably really have questions about suggesting to other people. Yeah. I mean, you know, because it is so dated in 1989. I think he would have changed things in it. And yeah. it's a shame he's not with us so he can do that. Yeah. But, you know, it's a it's kind of frozen in time. Yeah. Well, Broomstick, um, I recommend it. It's on my our unofficial reading list uh, for those who are in our coven that are just interested in, like, I want to learn more about Wicca. And I put it on there, and I remember... 
a couple people, not in our coven, but a couple people like that's on your suggested reading list. And I'm like, it's a really good book if you just want to be introduced to some of those basics. And, and I think yeah. that's part of the problem with it is people would look at that one and go, it needs to go more in depth. It's literally a 101 book. It's that a 101. It is the purpose of this book. It's yeah. not meant to go any deeper. You can argue that with maybe some of her other books, but like that particular one is a very great it's intro. Your, it's a basic. It's your basics. And I think it's a great, and I, my husband, when he decided to start getting into Wicca, I said, read the, to write a silver broomstick book. And he read it and he's like, yeah, yeah, I like it. He was like, it's, it was engaging and I got some really good stuff out of it. So there's a lot to be said for those books. And it's a, really a shame kind of what's happened to her. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand a lot of it's the backlash for having written Teen Witch and stuff. But as someone who writes for Llewellyn, sometimes they come to you with ideas. And yeah. you do the best that you can with the ideas. Right? Yeah. And I think that she did the best she could with that idea. And whatever gets anybody through the door is okay with me. There right? You, you yes. know, it's... Obviously, that book has gotten a lot of people through the door. I know that people still obsess over the teenagers who were on the original cover of Teen Witch. You know, yeah. like, because she wrote the fiction books about them, yeah, so they also the all have names. I read one of those. Yeah. The Witch's Chillers series. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think those need to all go back into print. I'm just going to throw that out there, Llewellyn. But... Okay. Ellen Dugan has now done some of those where she's got her Llewellyn nonfiction and now she's got her, her fiction series. Mm -hmm. It was a very um, kind of similar setup that happened between Silver oh, really? then and what Ellen is doing now. Yeah, Deborah Blake's the same way. She's got yeah, a lot yeah, of she, books too. My cover sister just said Deborah Blake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great up? minds. Great minds. That is mine. Grab your white Russian. Would you want to grab her white Russian? Sorry, grab it. We have white Russians and wine flowing over here, so double fisting. <laughs> I was confused whether it was a drink or a large white Russian. You know, it's well, you never know in this house because we are diverse people. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jason, I'd like to hear. I'm I'm sure everyone, but I just want to hear it. I what what do you think about um? When we were talking about, I was talking about the gatekeeping and the people that are, are saying, we. I would like to go into more about that. Why do you feel it's important to let people practice their spirituality, especially in witchcraft? Because it's probably along the same lines why we feel it, but I want to hear someone say it. Why do you feel that's important for us to, to as witches and as people who are, are I, I feel we're a minority. Um, why do you feel that's important for us to support other people's versions of witchcraft and what they study. Well, I think for a lot of witches, practicing witchcraft is about empowerment. It's about taking control of your life and the circumstances around your life. And if you're dictating what people can and can't do, then they're obviously not in control of their life. They're not empowering themselves to the degree that they could be empowering themselves. Yeah. Because they're stuck having to listen to this person yell at them, you know, yeah. and everybody works differently. What I do may not work for somebody else. You know, if you go back to thinking about all the 101 books, they're all kind of different, even though they teach a lot of the same things. They all are different in their own ways and different things resonate with different people. I'm writing a magic book right now and I'm writing with a couple of other people and we're talking about hematite the other day. And yeah. it's a stone. And for some people, they say when they touch hematite, like, it drains all the power out of them. Like, they can feel it, like, like leaving their body and going into the stone. And for other people, hematite is like a battery. Like, they can hold it, and then they feel all this energy come into them. Because we all react differently to different things. Yes. You know, which is part of why we practice differently. And then I think essentially, like I know as a, a witch who's very into ritual, you know, like ritual is one of the centerpieces of what I do. To me, ritual is about connecting with things. And we're all trying to connect, but we might connect to like different ideas or different higher powers or 
different ways of doing things, whatever it is. And if somebody is gatekeeping, saying, no, that you can't do this, then maybe you don't get to make that connection that you needed to make. Well, it's personal. I mean, you can't, I mean, there's, yes, obviously there are wonderful um, guidelines and whatnot that, that are very important to know in witchcraft. But when it comes right down to it, it's a very personal experience and you cannot dictate someone's personal experience because we're all going to feel it and experience it in different ways. It's like doing a journey. Everybody's going to have a different experience. Yeah. yeah. Doing a, going on the same well, journey. Doing a journey. I'm going to yeah. use some language you don't often hear in our circles, but I think that there's a certain level of gatekeeping someone's access to the gods is kind of impious. You're putting yourself, you're, how, do, how can you speak for the gods? How can you speak for the gods? Yes, and I feel sometimes people do that. They're like, well, the gods told me that I'm not supposed to allow this to happen. Well, that means for you. Yeah, maybe for <laughs> you. I think, I think a lot of the draw for those of us who are theistic is simply that the gods speak for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. It also, it also defies like how the gods were understood in the ancient world. So if you worshipped Aphrodite 2,000 years ago in Athens... There were several different versions of Aphrodite that oh, were all yeah. worshipped simultaneously. Yes. So the idea that only one person spoke for a particular deity is absurd. It's yeah. completely absurd. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, your relationship... So your email is Pan Mankey. Oh, yay, this helps me segue. Yes. So <laughs> I wanted to talk about your relationship with Pan. Thank you for not talking about Pokemon. That's, that's a good one. Oh! I will get there. Oh, oh. She's, got, she's got a lot. She's got. <laughs> All right. She's I mean, got I'm ready. I'm ready when you're spring it on me. I'm ready. Am I? Am I? I don't want to assume, but I mean, you know, I was emailing you, and I that email kept popping up, Pan Mankey, Pan Mankey, and sure. I'm like, I'm like, this guy likes Pan, and I've heard through other people, yeah, he, he likes Pan, so right. can you tell us your relationship with Pan and 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 what that's all about? You know, I was a young Republican at one point in my life. Get the fuck out of town. President of my church youth group. Uh, so I was a little repressed. Uh, you know, I, uh, maybe a lot repressed. Pan was my liberation from that <laughs> repression. Pan. You know? Pan! Eo Pan! Eo Pan. Eo Pan. 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 Yeah, so, you know, I when I got into witchcraft, I got into it because of the goddess. You know, I I wanted to be enfolded in the rapture of the goddess. Not like a particular goddess, but the goddess. Right? <laughs> and that was like my thing. That was all I cared about. And when I started like reading my first Wicca books, which is well, what I practice now and what I gravitated towards immediately back then, you know, there was this god always sort of lurking on the sidelines. Yeah. You know, but this was a lot of witchcraft books from the 80s and 90s sort of really downplayed the horn god. So they gave yeah. you lots of options. And I decided my god would look like Apollo, you know? You know, he would look like basically Robert Plant. You know, that would be my god. <laughs> and, you I know, love. I've sort of patterned myself on you, that. You've got that whole thing with Robert Plant. So yeah, I love it. Pattern, yeah. yeah. But... You know, like from a spiritual perspective, and I have nothing against Apollo. I've been to, to Delphi. I've been to his temple and stuff, and I like him. But I don't know. Like, the connection really wasn't there. And I felt like this kind of humming inside of me for a couple of years saying, you know, you need to start acknowledging the great god Pan. And I'd be like, no, that would be acknowledging some sort of devil, and I'm just not ready to, to dive over, right? I'm just not ready for that. Still had yeah. short hair. You know, hadn't had been with enough people. I was not ready to take that dive. But and one day, though, I just kind of yelled his name and felt his power and his presence. I felt something change within me because I was pretty shy, introverted, you know, and I still am sort of shy and introverted a little bit. But, you know, Pan gives me confidence in myself. Pan gives me energy and it gives me power. You know, he's a god of passion and lust, and he's a connection 
to wild spaces. You know, we don't really have that in Western religion very often. Certainly there's not really much of anything in Christianity that does that. But Pan, as he was understood beginning in the 19th century, provided a perfect conduit into being in the woods alone at midnight and not feeling scared, but feeling fucking alive, right? And that that's the power of Pan. And it's also a little bit the power of Kronos, too, who's also very important and you know we call we just call him c in our house you know pan is one syllable we call dionysus d and kernono c you know because we're lazy but you know (laughs) c has that sort of energy too but pan was the pan was the first you know he was the first and he opened up this world of exploring horned gods you know for a long time that's basically all i did was do like horned god lectures when I was teaching yeah. shit and yeah. I've decided after doing them as I've gotten older and actually know more things, which also means I know less things because I'm not dumb and speaking absolutes like I did probably 15 years ago. I, I vowed I would never write a horn God book and that comes out in June. So very excited <laughs> yes! about that. Yes! <laughs> I love that. Um, well, we, 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 our, our coven, our, our patroness goddess is Hecate and our patron god is Pan. So we, we, we very much, I'm, uh, and I'm the high priestess and my husband is the high priest. So we, I invoke Hecate every two weeks and he invokes Pan and it's, it's a nice balance. And, uh, we, we're big lovers of Pan. We are also big uh, lovers of. Can you pour the wine? Dionysus. Pour the wine. Uh, Dionysus <laughs> is very much celebrated well, in uh, this house. Uh, we've well, got our we've got our Bacchus back here. Yeah. Do you know Aurora had fun with the TikTok challenge where witches were singing the cult of Dionysus, and you could only sing the parts that were okay. It wasn't just witches, but you could only sing the parts that were okay with your religion. So witches come in and they're like wine and women. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're just like, so, we can sing all of it. But then yeah. you had other religions where they're like, we can't sing We can't this. sing that. Wine yeah. and women and all the vices. Welcome to the cult of Dionysus. So <laughs> I, I don't know if you know all of, I'm guessing you do, the Pan's children, but Silenos, one of his children, being friend of Dionysus, teaching him the winemaking. For that, sure. I actually took my name, the god of debauchery and wine production. He's Silenus after Silenos. So we, yeah. we keep the we keep that energy going. Um, like Kevin says, did you have a, a, a question? I have a, a question slash check-in. <laughs> <laughs> so you say Pokemon. We're going to go into the Wayback Machine and go to Many Gods West. Oh. I was the one who gave you the Pan Mankey. Yes. And I shade. Yeah. And I can is it dead? Is it okay? No. Oh. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know this. Get out. Yeah. We are waiting to see if Jason Mankey can find. The Pat Mankey. Oh my God, she made. I. I love it. I love this thing. <laughs> it sits in my living room. I've taken it on lots of adventures. It's been to lots of pagan festivals with with me over the years. I I absolutely adore my little pan mankey. I, <laughs> you I love him so much. And I was waiting the like entire con to like give it the right time, and then it was finally just before we did a Dionysus ritual. I was like, here, take this. <laughs> it's it's it, I will admit though, it's weird to get things from people. Because I never, I never expected that ever in my life, right? And I don't, and I'll admit, like I don't, like I love it. I'm so, I love, I love this thing. Obviously, you. <laughs> how long ago was that? Uh, how four long? Years ago. Four yeah, years ago. four years. That's yeah. a. Oh my God! Look at the connection you have with that happen. <laughs> but it is. It's it's so like crazy weird that people like give me things it's just it's 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 lovely and it's flattering and stuff but never in a million years did i ever expect such generosity i think it's funny though because he jokes he's like 
The Pokemon. Yes, I know about the Mankey Pokemon, but I'm like, but I put horns on him. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> what it's is a the Pan Mankey? Okay, what is the the Pokemon? Mankey. Mankey. It's a. Oh, it's a Pokemon. It's a yeah, it's, oh! it's the yeah. white. It doesn't have the horns. It's just like got a, it, a got a it. Okay. Monkey gorilla type thing. Yeah, monkey monkey. The, well, the now half you're... monkey, half rat. Yes. Yeah. What it is. Yeah. Well, now yeah. you are forever connected to our coven because my yeah. coven sister did. I love that. This is like <laughs> serendipitous. I had no idea she did that. She was saving this. I was. She's like, I, I didn't know she did this. She's like, oh, I need to be there because I need to ask him something. I need to ask him something. And I'm like, what are you going to ask him? Like, <laughs> You know, you're talking about Dionysus for a second and kind of doubling back to Pan. Yes. One of the weird things in our house about Pan is Pan and my wife do not get along. So I would think Pan and a lot of wives maybe don't. I well, don't know. Complain when Pan's I don't complain about when Pan's in the house, but say, yeah. how, why don't why doesn't your wife get along with Pan? Pan is not like a fan of monogamy. Well <laughs> we know that, yes. Yeah. Uh so you know, it's kind of a conflict between the two natures, you know. Yes. So, yeah, Dionysus between my wife and I is kind of like the patron deity of the house. Yes. Have, yeah. have your wife invoke him. Have and your wife invoke Pan. Yes. Ah. <laughs> because I'm telling you, I invoked Pan during one of our coven uh, rituals. And oh my God, I was just like, oh, this is great. Like I felt like a, I, I, I stood with my legs apart because he had really big balls. Like <laughs> I was just like, and he had a really big penis, and I couldn't. I, I just was standing with my legs apart and like just feeling very like like virile and like maybe she needs to do that because it kind of took me to do that. To understand that that energy, try to have her invoke Pan. It's really fun. Yeah. <laughs> Play with her big balls. <laughs> we'll we'll see if the, we'll see and if that works. works. I don't know. She is the soundtrack. Um... <laughs> so, <laughs> clink and drink, clink and drink to big balls. That's that's all I'm saying. Clink and drink to big balls. Clink and drink to big balls. Yes. Ooh. So, Jason, you're working on a new book. What's your new book about? The Horn God. The Horn well, God? You said magic. What did you say? I'm drinking. So, I don't know. So the thing about writing books for Llewellyn is when you get done with a book, it doesn't come out for like a year. Okay. So what you're working on is never even the next book that's going to come out in my case at this point. Yeah. So, like, the Yule book just came out, and... In June, the Horn God of the Witches comes out. Okay. Which is about Horn God in kind of in a modern sense, but also deep dives into Pan and Kernonos, which you know are the two sort of biggest ancient <laughs> representations of the Horn God. Can you tell us about when you say the Horn God in a modern sense? What are what are you talking about with that? So you know when we're little baby witches and we're reading our books from the 80s and 90s. They often talk about the horn god as a single entity. Like the first the first male deity was the horn god and then he spread out across the world in various forms. That's not true. I mean there was not an one ancient horn god. There were a lot of horned and antlered deities. So we look at horned and antlered deities. But where did this idea of one universal horn god come from? And what are sort of the building blocks in the creation of that the horned god of traditional witchcraft or the horned god of wicca how are those interpreted and where did that come from so the second half of the book looks at a couple of different sources one is 19th century english poetry believe it or not i believe so, it yeah so a lot of keats and shelley there's some kenneth graham wind in the willows there's a literary influence there a couple of other poems that I've picked out, you know, and we kind of go through all of that. But then there's also sort of this idea of the sacrificial God that really 
is expressed most poetically in the works of Sir James Fraser in a big series of books known as the Golden Bough. Most of us have yeah. like the annotated Golden Bough, like the single yeah. edition copy. And, you know, he talks about this vegetation deity who is sacrificed for the good of people and every year and then comes back to life. And that's not really what the ancients believed. You know, like when Osiris dies, Osiris becomes the king of the underworld. He doesn't like come back to life every year. He no. dies and becomes yeah. king of the underworld. Yeah. Uh, so it talks about that. And we've attached that particular piece of mythology to the wheel of the year, often in the form of the horned god. You know, like when you're doing your autumn equinox ritual or your uh, Lamas ritual or maybe even your sound ritual. A lot of those rituals use the death of the horn god as a trope, you know. I kill bread cows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, like when, I, I when... slaughter bread cows. She makes bread cows and slaughters. Yeah. 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 It's fun. So, I mean, that's a part of it. And then there's also, and this really upsets a lot of people, but the, some of the ideas of the witch trials and the Satan that's described there really show up in the Horn God of Modern Witchcraft. So uh, go back to Margaret Murray and we look through the witch cult in Western Europe and sort of talk about what was in that particular book and a few others and what's a couple of other ideas and how they were transferred to the modern Horn God mythos. Yes. Yeah. And then there's like looks of like the history of the Horn God within Wicca. Like what did Gerald Gardner say about the Horn God? Why does the Horn God sort of disappear in the 80s and early 90s for a while? Because you read a lot of books and it's like, Our you know, <laughs> to <laughs> Gerald, the Horn God was the thing, right? This yeah. is the God of the witches. And then you're reading Scott Cunningham and it's like, well, you know, some witches worship a Horn God and then <laughs> some worship a Sun God. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of different kinds of gods and you can just kind of do what you want with it, you know? And I'm like, no, fucker has horns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, do you think that that might be because of the of the ebb and flow of gender equality? Because I feel like when there was a time when the women and maybe feminists were really coming out, it was like the goddess, the goddess, and we want to we want to put and. and this is in no way offense to anyone that that just is full goddess worship that because there's a there's a time and place for that but i feel like the goddess and the horned god kind of switch the off answer, and on the answer is yes the well, answer is yes you have that and you had the pr campaign that came along especially in the 80s when you had that satanic panic thing yeah and we had to distance ourselves even more from like, oh, we don't, we don't want to we worship don't something do with horns. That. I yes. think satanic panic was one of the biggest drivers of that. I think that there was a conscious effort to sort of uncouple Wicca, especially from the horn god and some of that imagery, and especially time witchcraft sort of fell out of favor for a while, and it was always yeah. Wicca. Well, I'm not a witch; I'm a Wiccan, you know. Yeah. And, and Gerald Gardner was pretty clear. The book was called, you know, Witchcraft Today, not Wicca Today. You know, it's witchcraft. It was like yeah. Wicca is a fine word, and, they, you know, that can be used for things too, but they were witches, and that was first and foremost. But we, yeah. because of Satanic Panic, I think those two things happened. Well, and then there were us in the 80s when the Satanic Panic was going on, because I was a teenager in the 80s. And I loved it because I, I was all about it was all about the rebellion. And like so I I even though I knew there was a tongue in cheek kind of way the way I approached the satanic panic. But for me, that was a symbol of my rebellion. So any horned god, whether it was Kernunos or Pan or Satan himself was always being presented in my group of friends because we were very punk rock and we were very, you know what I mean? So some people ate that up in a way. They, they you know, they say no press is bad press. So, or, or no, no, all press is, what does it say? All press all is good press. It's good press. No press is bad press. Sorry, yes. I've had some wine. Yeah. Um, what have you had? 
wine on uh, witches and wine. I'm sorry, uh, Lysander, our coven brother over here, who's off camera. What would you like to say? Witches have always been part of the counterculture. So yes. Of course. And the Satanic Panic also drew a lot of people who would not let the Horn God go away. Yes. Yes, we are part of the counterculture. And in the 80s, I feel like even though it may have scared people off, it drew a lot of people in and made us want to research, okay, who's this? What is the origins? Because that's what it did for me. What are the origins of this horned creature you know what are the origins of that well that's even we can go back to gardner again and that's why he handed the book that was like we do ritual nudity have fun yeah yeah how do you feel about that come back to me after you've read that yeah, like that's exactly the counterculture thing and the we're not well we've always been on the hedge of normal the yeah been on the outskirts we're on the outskirts abnormally normal abnormally normal normally abnormal, abnormal. abnormal. yes clink and drink to the horned god i have no wine in my I have a white Russian got, now. She has a white Russian. Clean can drink to the horn back. So. EO Pan. EO Pan. EO Pan. EO Pan. EO EO Pan. Pan. Okay. So. Jason, what do you want to talk about? We've got we've got a few minutes before we hit. We try to keep it around an hour because people have ADD, and so we don't want to we don't want to like. It's leave. a good length. Yeah. What? It's a perfect length, about an hour. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is. And um, can That's I just? What she said. <laughs> can I just tell you? This is not an insult. You, you kind of remind. Do you know Patton Oswalt, the cop comedian? Yes. You kind of remind me of him, and that's a compliment, because you got. Do you, are you familiar with yeah. him? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. That's a compliment. I'm com I'm complimenting we, you. Too. My wife and I both <laughs> follow his Twitter account. We're down. Yes. You you remind me of him. Your 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 yeah. your tone, not just your. You don't look like him, but you have a tone that's very similar. And there was something you said earlier, and I was like, "That's so Patton Oswalt." And so I just wanted to throw that out there because it, well, I had some wine. It might be stealing a shtick. I don't know. You, you know. might be. You're like the Patton Oswalt of the of the witches. I think I'll look worse. So. <laughs> so much much worse. So that's that's good. Can you tell us about, are, are you doing anything, like, promote yourself? Is there anything coming up that you're doing? Are you... It's 2020, where, where so all it's, the festivals are canceled. The festivals are canceled. <laughs> are you doing any online stuff? We just got to see you do, like I said, for Hecate Sickle. Your your workshop was amazing. Uh, are you doing anything? Where can we find you? Tell me all of that stuff. It's a weird time to be doing things because, I'm, you know... First of all, it's November. So November, December, January are always kind of the quietest on the calendar, even yeah. during a normal year. Yes. So there's not much in the way that's coming up. On the 19th of November, I will be doing, which is a Thursday, I'll be doing a live thing on my Facebook page. It's kind of like the book signing that I didn't get to have for the Yule book this year, where I'll be doing a free talk about the history of Yule and some of my favorite Yuletide traditions and customs or whatever. And that's just going to be on my Facebook page. Yay! So anybody who scrolls past will be forced to watch it. That's how <laughs> I look at it. That's how I'm going to build an audience. You know, I'm just going to force people to listen to me. So yeah. that's coming up. That's a pretty, that's a pretty big deal to me because, you know, every time I've written a book, I've had some sort of author launch party and my friends like it. And it's really gratifying and fun and I didn't get to do that this year, you know, this yeah. and it's really disappointing because this was the kind of book. Since it's not like 100 percent a witch book, this is the book I could have gone to like a non witch store uh -huh. and done, you know, a signing and a lot of things. Yes. And that's just not going to happen this time, you know, no. that's, you know, really sad. It is. Yeah. So that's coming up. I'm excited about that. Uh, other than that. You know, everything's quiet. I think I got something in December, uh, yeah. like a, like a workshop or something. Yeah. But but I don't know. 
some sometimes the details of these things aren't ironed out well, so I don't really know like what the details are yet. No, totally and, understandable. And it's 2020, so time is irrelevant. It is. It things really don't really is. matter. They don't matter. It's just, yeah. I feel like we're in a weird like dream state right now. Uh, but you know, it's. I'm so glad we got to talk because you're so fun. You're, I love you're relaxed. You're, you're one of our, my type of people where we can just be ourselves and, and have a good time. And I really appreciate that. I've loved, I love your energy and I really appreciate you, uh, you being on our show because we are, we're the little engine that could, <laughs> our show is, is, you know, we're not taking off like, you know, you know, like, Slow down there, Turbo. We're just kind of, we're slowly If you build building. it, they will come. If you build it, they will come. We and have created videos, and we are putting them up on our channel, and people watch them. People watch them, and so you're helping <laughs> us bring more people in, and I really appreciate that, Jason. I really do. I, I will say that, like, COVID, there's some good things that have come out of yeah. it in our greater community. I really think a lot of the online festivals might be the future. Not yes. completely. No. But I think that they make seeing a bunch of authors and stuff more attainable for a lot of people. And the price point's a lot less because you don't have to camp or you don't have to rent a hotel room. Travel, yeah. 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 So I, I think those are good things. Hopefully that will continue. But it's also been kind of an investment in people listening to podcasts and watching videos because they can't do the in-person things anymore. So I think that's given some of our creators a leg up i think it's hurt musicians a lot who yeah. really kind of do the best on the road i think maybe yeah so, I mean, being a full-time pagan musician or a full-time pagan anything is yeah. always an uphill challenge to begin with it is yeah and and we have we have made connections i mean i i am i'm blessed to have made connections with so many people that i'm able to connect with on our show or or even for festivals or whatnot it has been it has been such a delight to see people that i maybe may, may never have been able to see in the past so and i appreciate your willingness to do this i mean when you when you were at our workshop and you showed up you already knew you've done this you were like and it was so nice and i was i was so nervous because it was i was producing it that one and i remember you were like no, I'm here, and you know, and then afterwards you're like, I hope I didn't make you stress out, and I'm like, no, that wasn't you, Jason. That was me wanting to make it perfect, and you did. You were you were the easiest workshop presenter I had to work with because you just came in, and you're like, yep, got it set up, blah blah blah, let's talk, and I was like, oh, I can actually sit back and listen to this, you know. <laughs> Well, I, I, you know, I, I think I'm supposed to be there 10 minutes early and I waltz in like with three minutes to spare, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, fuck it. I, I know how to do this shit. I don't need any setup. I'm, I'm ready. I, you were. And I, I so appreciate that. And I was like a little panicky because I'm about like, this is my first, you were my first producing production live for the festival. So I wanted to make sure everything was, you know. <laughs> and that's why I was like, are you coming? Are you here? And you showed up and I was like, okay, he's here. And you're like, I got it. Boom, boom, boom. And I was like, I had nothing to worry about. But I appreciate you sending the, me the message after. You're like, I'm sorry if I stressed you out. And I was like, no. Oh, my God. Jason, you sweetheart. That was me stressing myself out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like I've done so much ATC stuff this year yeah. that I'm like an honorary member. You, you know, because... You absolutely are but an that's, honorary that's member. That's what I was going to say. Like, we tended to frequent circles where they try and not go on Pagan Standard Time. But the problem is you still end up on on Pagan Standard Time. Yeah. Like, it, it, you can't. Yeah. You can't and, really. and it, it was, but you were just so easy to work with. And I, I was the one that set myself up because I was like, this is, because I was the workshop coordinator. <laughs> This was no my pressure. people that I brought in to present workshops and and everyone else was producing before me. And I was like, OK, this is me producing now. And I want to show these people that I know what I'm doing. 
And, you know, and, but you were so easy to work with and you were just like, you were such a professional and you are, you're an honorary ATC member. You are an honorary witches and wine member. If you ever want to, we would love to have you come back. If you've got stuff you want to talk about, I, we would love that. You are hey, been great. I love hearing myself talk. So anytime <laughs> is really fine. You what know. a sign. What's that? Oh, Capricorn. Yeah. I like to hear myself talk, too. I'm a Capricorn. I like to hear myself talk, too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm usually pretty good at it, so, you yeah, know. I'm really good at it. All yeah. right. So, for, thank you so much, Jason. So, before we go, I would like to let our viewers know that if you are interested in being a guest on our show, if you have any questions for our coven, you can always email us at crossroadscoven at gmail.com. What was that again? Crossroads Kevin at gmail.com. Gmail Thank you for being with us. Remember, everyone, please be kind to one another. Always walk with the goddess and the horned one. And until next time, blessed be. Have a wonderful night, everyone. And drink wine because that's how it's done. Where do I stop the recording? <laughs> right there. Where? Oh, stop recording. Right to stop recording. Words.